Hey Calvary, good morning and thanks for joining us for today's service. Hope you've enjoyed a good Memorial Day weekend so far with friends and family. And I know many of you are working hard already as the summer season kicks off. Well, today we're kicking off a short three-week message series on prayer called The Disciples' Path to Prayer. Uh, for many of you, maybe you've been praying all your life, and for others, you might be brand new to prayer. And we're going to take a few weeks to talk about some essentials, like how can you pray in God's will? Uh, how do you pray for other believers around you? And how do you pray when you're really in a time of pain? So today, we're gonna to be uh, going to Matthew's Gospel, chapter six, what's called the Lord's Prayer, Sermon on the Mount. It's the most famous teaching that Jesus ever gave. And in that, he teaches us some essentials to prayer that I think of as kind of like a map, if you're on a trail system. We're down here on a bike trail, one of many that Cass County has. They're beautiful, hope you get to get out and use them. And since I've lived here quite a while, I'm pretty familiar with them. But if I was going to a new area to bike, the first thing that I would look for is a map. First, it's gonna give you an orientation, which way is north, south, east, and west. Second, it's gonna give you your location. Where are you at in the big picture of this area that you're in? And third, it's gonna give you some things to look for. Bridges, intersections, bathrooms, towns, things that you're gonna anticipate or things that you're gonna pass on this journey. Well, as we go through the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is going to show us essentially a short, memorable blueprint that really you can commit to memory. To use not only to pray verbatim, although that's good, but think of it as a format that you can use to fill in with your own specific needs of your family, church, and community. So that's what we're doing. We're looking at Jesus' beginning instruction for learning how to pray and trust me, it's a map that you will never grow out of. So let's head back to church, find Matthew 6 if you will. We'll see you there. Okay, uh, welcome back to Church Calvary. Uh, we're in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6. Uh, we're starting a three-week series on prayer. Today's topic is... Uh, learning from Jesus how to pray in God's will. So if you got a Bible open, New Living Translation is what I'm reading out of. Uh, Matthew 6 says this, <clears throat> uh, Watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose your reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they've received all the reward they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that's all the reward they will ever get. <clears throat> but when you pray... Go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. And then your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on and on as people of other religions do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them. For your Father knows exactly what you need, even before you ask Him. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven... May your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. And when you fast, don't make it obvious, as the hypocrites do, <clears throat> for they try to look miserable and disheveled, so people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, that is the only reward they will ever get. <clears throat> but when you fast, comb your hair, wash your face, and then no one will notice that you are fasting, except your Father, who knows what you do in private. And your Father who sees everything, will reward you. Let's pray. 
Uh, Father in heaven, uh, this day uh, we come to you grateful for Memorial Day weekend, uh, for the start of the summer season, for families who can come north and enjoy the outdoors, and for the uh, importance this has to our local economy. Uh, Father, our hearts come uh, grateful as we reflect and remember those who have uh, served in the armed forces to the point of sacrificing their lives for the freedoms that we enjoy every day. Uh, Lord God, may we not only remember their sacrifice, but learn from it, be inspired by it, uh, to live lives of sacrificial love ourselves. Lord, we pray for our nation this day. Uh, we have so many heartaches, so many divisions. Uh, Lord, we think of this uh, poor school that was under attack this last week and so many uh, children um, killed and families hurting and a community rocked. Lord God, we pray for your help for them, for us, for our nation, because it seems like everywhere we turn, uh, we see challenges and heartaches and troubles. And Lord, some days it's just overwhelming. So we want to pray for our leaders locally and state and nationally, tribal. Lord, we pray for ourselves as a church. May we be people of light and people of hope who trust in you in the ups and downs of life. And now, Lord, I just pray uh, for this time in your word that you would teach us how to have a real daily conversation with you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Let Jesus teach you how to pray. Uh, that's the whole sermon in a nutshell. He's fully God. He knows what it's like to have needs like you and I have. And, or he's fully man, and he knows the needs that you and I have. And being fully God, he sees things from a heavenly point of view that you and I don't have. Uh, in some ways, prayer is so simple that any child can do it. We often say things like, it's just talking to God. Talk to him like you would a friend. On the other hand, prayer is a mystery. <clears throat> uh, how can tiny, temporary, confused people like us have a real conversation with a God who's infinite, eternal, and almighty. Uh, it kind of blows the mind to think about. I have to set up an appointment to see Dennis, Dr. Banker, and yet the creator of the whole universe is available to me anytime, anywhere to discuss anything. That's a mystery. So Jesus um, is our savior He's our model, and he is our teacher for how to live. And he wants to teach you and I how to carry out this conversation with God that we call prayer. So four lessons today. Lesson number one, <clears throat> prayer needs a warning label. It needs a warning label, just like all other spiritual practices can do, that if you are doing them to be seen by people and to make a good impression, that kind of spiritual practice goes straight to rot. Um, if you're doing prayer or giving or fasting or any other spiritual activity um, <clears throat> to be approved of by others, to be thought well of, then Jesus says that's all the reward you're going to get because your father is concerned about what's really going on in your heart, about your motivations. He's concerned about what you do in private. So there is a time and place to play and pray in public. Uh, there's certainly a time and place to pray in church or in a small group or with your ministry team and certainly with your family. But the real question of your prayer life <clears throat> is what goes on when it's just you and God. And the great thing about that is you can go in the closet and shut the door. God will meet you there. But he can also meet you out on the riding lawnmower or on that long commute day after day or when you're sitting in a boat or when you're just sitting up awake alone in the night. God is there with you. And that's where the reality of your personal relationship with God is expressed. If you're in church leadership, if your family and friends look to you as role models, if you're comfortable praying out loud, be careful. Pay attention to the warning. <clears throat> because you never get so far down the road that you can't find yourself in a ditch of letting your prayer turn into something other 
than a simple direct communication with the Lord. Once it becomes about having the right vocabulary, saying the right things, um, getting that, those acknowledgments, oh, good prayer, Pastor. Uh, that's when prayer or any other spiritual practice is uh, losing ground. Second, uh, pray to your Father in heaven. Uh, Jesus uses the word Father 10 times in 18 verses. Now, the Bible has lots of names for God, and they're all there for a reason. Um, learn them. Get to know the different pictures that Scripture gives you. But for me, for prayer, Jesus put this, your Father in heaven, at the top of the list. This is how Jesus prayed. <clears throat> it's how he teaches his disciples to pray. Uh, the word in Jesus' language was Abba. It's a word that kids would use for their dad. So <clears throat> personally, it helps me to personalize this, to make the reality of it real to me when I think that God wants me to see him <laughs> as my loving dad in heaven. <clears throat> now that may sound way too familiar to you, but again, don't miss that the analogy here is family, and family is familiar. Respectful, yes, but loving. Father defines a relationship of how he responds to us, and it defines our position as sons or daughters that belong to him. <clears throat> now, if you had a loving father who's kind and compassionate and honorable, um, let that be to you an earthly imperfect example of what a heavenly perfect father is like. And if you didn't have that, if your dad was absent or angry or abusive, and you knew in your heart that you were meant for something more, that there's something you were missing out that you were designed for, let that longing do the same thing to point you to a Father in heaven who sees you and knows you by name and cares about you. And look to Jesus if you don't know what the Father's like, because Jesus came to explain and reveal who the Father is. He did that by his teaching, and he did that by his character and personality. Jesus said when we look at him, we see what the Father is like. So if you see a Father image as negative, let that image get rewritten, redrawn by the person of Jesus Christ. I don't know anything that will influence your prayer life so much as your mental picture of God. <coughs> Is God an impersonal force like electricity? Is he an angry judge ready to drop the hammer? Is he a distant king? Or is he God, your father, who loves you a God who is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry, and full of unfailing love. Because that's who Jesus wants us to be able to talk to every day. Lesson three, uh, pray the Father's priorities first. Uh, if you have been a parent or a grandparent, you know that sometimes the parent's priorities and the child's priorities are not the same. Uh, there can take a lot of alignment from uh, parental wisdom and priorities to where a child's uh, hungers, needs, wants, desires are at. There's a gap there. So this, for me, is where learning from Jesus how to pray, in some sense, means I get flipped upside down in order that I can pray right side up. Um, Back on that bike path, imagine that I'm biking down the trail and I think I'm heading south to Akeley and Jesus pulls up alongside me, slows me down and lets me know that I'm actually heading north to Walker and I need to do a 180. <clears throat> these three verses, or these few verses, our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy, may your kingdom come soon, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's honor, God's kingdom, God's will, uh, that for me is a change of direction from my natural impulse. My natural impulse is to come to God with my needs, my concerns, my priorities, my agenda. Uh, I do come like a child in that my priorities are not 
automatically mature. I don't automatically see things the way God does. I need to have my approach to God revised so that His priorities come in advance of my priorities. Um, <clears throat> when I pray, I need to let go of the idea that like God's sitting around looking for something to do and maybe if I send Him my to-do list, He'll get it on His work schedule. Um, God already has an agenda. <laughs> God already knows what needs to be done. God is already aware of all of my needs. But when Jesus teaches me to pray, he is seeking to align my heart and my will to God's priorities. First, the honor of God's name. That people would know him for who he really is and treat him uh, rightly and respond to him in a way that is God-honoring and that is ultimately a blessing to themselves. <clears throat> that God's kingdom would advance. <clears throat> that uh, God's influence, God's domain, the place where people are willingly cooperative with God's direction, that that would grow and grow and grow in my part of the world and in the entire world. And then that God's will would be done. God's will in my work, in my family, in my community, in my nation. Um, it is always easy to come to God telling him what needs to be done, especially if people aren't doing what you want them to do, especially if you want God to change somebody else so that you can be more comfortable and more relaxed yourself. Uh, those are easy prayers to pray. But Jesus says the starting point is the honor of God's name, not my name. Uh, God's kingdom, not my little kingdom. And God's will done on earth as it is in heaven. Not Mark using heaven to get his will done on earth. Uh, I've been on all kinds of boats. Uh, many of you have as well. I've been in canoes and kayaks. I've been in fishing boats and pontoon boats and speed boats. I've even been on a couple huge cruise liners. There's one thing they all have in common. They all pull up to the pier to tie up. The pier does not pull up to them. They pull up and move towards the dock and shore. The shore and the dock don't move to them. <clears throat> for me, that's kind of a picture of my relationship with God and His will. It's easy for me to think that my job in prayer is to pray hard enough and long enough to pull God in my direction and make Him do things my way. And Jesus says, wait a minute, remember who is the boat and who is the shore here? And start by aligning my desires, my heart, my will with the Father's priorities. Fourth thing, uh, pray for our needs. Uh, Jesus doesn't say I, me, and mine. He says us, the community of Jesus followers, our, the family of God, the brothers and sisters who follow Jesus and belong to God the Father. We are to pray for our needs. Um <clears throat> Now, you can certainly pray this word for word, and many of us maybe grew up in churches where it was used regularly, and we can recite it by memory. And that's a great thing so long as your heart and mind are engaged when you do it. Don't let it become just a mindless routine. But Jesus is brief for a reason. We can remember things that are short, much easier than things that are long. But for me, I will say there's also value in this not only in reciting it verbatim, but in using it as a framework inside which I pause at stops and fill in the needs of my own life and the people around me. So I do pray for daily bread. <clears throat> but what is daily bread? Well, it's more than just breakfast and lunch. It's what are the things in my life that I truly need that are not just wants and desires and wishes, but the things that we really need physically, emotionally, spiritually, for my life, for my family, for the people that God has put around me, uh, do I take time and bring those real needs to a Father who really does provide and cares for us? Including in that is spiritual needs. First, the forgiveness of sins. Father, forgive us our sins. Um, <clears throat> no matter how long we walk with Christ, Sin will always be an issue 
for us in this life, in this world. So for me, this is a place to take some time and pay attention to my heart and mind and what's going on inside and to name by name what Scripture calls these sins, uh, selfishness, uh, lies, deception, hate, lust, greed, idolatry, um, unbelief, what, whatever it is, am I willing to pause and allow the Spirit to convict me of that so that I can name it, admit it, own it, ask for forgiveness, and turn from it? Um, <clears throat> Uh, the Lord has plenty of work to do in me on the inside. And this is my opportunity daily to come to the Lord, uh, requesting and asking for his work in my own soul. And part of that work is my need for forgiveness. And part of it is my need to forgive. So these are frequently tied together in the teaching of Jesus. Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. Um, your father doesn't want you to carry the hurt and the hate that comes from being sinned against. Because we have all done wrong and we have all been wronged. We have all harmed others and we have all been harmed. And Jesus just brings together the grace of God that forgives us and the grace of God that flows through us to others, not only for their benefit, but for our own benefit, that we would not bear the burden, the crushing weight to drink the poison of bitterness and resentment and wounds that we refuse to allow to heal. Um, <clears throat> don't get this wrong. It's not like a good work that if you can be forgiving enough, then you'll be forgiven. This is something like forgiveness that we need God's help with. And by making it part of our prayer life, it's acknowledging to God our desire to do what he wants to do, our desire to be a vessel of his grace and mercy, but an acknowledgement of our need for his help in that. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> this is the time of year many of you are putting in gardens. Uh, if you give your garden fertilizer and water, it's going to give you fruit and flowers. When you give a wounded soul grace and mercy that forgives them, that grace and mercy becomes the fruit and the flower that that soul produces. Uh, Victoria Ruvalo was driving down the highway. Her car passed an oncoming car of teenagers. Uh, these four young men had stolen a credit card. They were going joyriding. They'd gone on a shopping spree, and they decided to buy a 20-pound frozen turkey. As they were cruising down the highway at full speed, a young man named Ryan Cushing decided it would be funny to throw the turkey out the window at an oncoming car. Well, that 20-pound frozen turkey came through Victoria's windshield, hit her in the face, and crushed her. Uh, she survived, but she had 10 hours of surgery and months of rehab. Many months later, <clears throat> after Ryan Cushing's trial, he was due to be sentenced, and the judge could give him up to 25 years for what he had done. But Victoria Ruvalo was in the court that day, and this is what she said. Despite the fear and the pain I have learned from this horrific experience that I have much to be thankful for. For each day when I wake up, I thank God simply because I am alive. I sincerely hope you have also learned from this awful experience, Ryan. There is no room for vengeance in my life, and I do not believe a long, hard prison sentence will do you or me or society any good. Well, Ryan Cushion wept in his apology in the courtroom that day. And the judge was so moved by Mrs. Rublo's testimony that instead of giving Ryan over 20 years, he gave him six months. And that man got a new chance at life. <clears throat> and finally, last thing that Jesus brings up here, and don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. We still deal with our own bent to sin. We still live in a world full of temptation 
and we still have a spiritual enemy in Satan who frankly is more than we will ever be able to handle on our own. So Jesus says, ask, ask for help, ask for guidance, ask for protection, ask to be delivered, rescued from temptation and the evil one. Um, <clears throat> there is one sense in which salvation is for all eternity when we trust Christ. And there is another sense in which I need some saving today. Because right now, I live in a spiritual environment that is full of ways to pollute my heart and twist my mind. And today, I need some saving from the Father God who loves me and who's given me the Holy Spirit to do a changing work in my life. <clears throat> Ask. <clears throat> Ask your Father in heaven for what you need. James Ford uh, at one time was a chaplain in the U.S. House of Representatives. As a young man, he went on a sailing adventure with two other friends. They had a 31-foot boat, and they wanted to go 6,000 miles from England to New York. Now, uh, James was a young father. He had five little kids, and his father tried to talk him out of taking this voyage. He said, wait till the kids are grown up. This is too risky for a young dad to do. But James didn't want to wait. He wanted to take the adventure. Well, out in the middle of the Atlantic, they got more adventure than they bargained on. They hit a hurricane, or to put it more realistically, a hurricane hit them. And for three days, they had dark clouds, driving rain, pressing wind, and 35-foot waves. Now, think of that for a moment. You're in a 31-foot boat, and you're in 35-foot waves. They were scared to death. And James Ford was thinking about his kids and about his dad who had told him not to go. And he said he wanted to pray, but he felt guilty for praying because he felt like a fool for being out there in the first place. Nobody made him take that trip. Well, finally, <coughs> on the third day, he blurted out a seven-word prayer. Oh God, I have had enough. Amen. That was it. So much for fluency, so much for praying a long time. And 30 minutes later, James Ford said that the clouds started to lift and the wind started to calm and the skies were blue an hour later. He writes, was my prayer tied to the opening of the sky? I don't worry about it. One thing is certain, simple, sincere prayers are sufficient. Uh, friends, you have a Father in heaven who loves you, and he gave Jesus his son so you could know him and be his child. And Jesus would teach us to pray in a way that is simple and sincere and sufficient. So remember the warning label. Pray for God, not for show. Pray to your Father. That sets the whole tone of your relationship with him. Pray the Father's priorities. We all have growing up to do in this area. Make God's priorities your priorities. And pray for your needs. They are many, not only for yourself, but for those around you. But bring them to the Father, knowing that He cares for you. If you do that, you'll be learning from Jesus how to pray. And you can know that you're praying in God's will. Let's pray right now. <clears throat> Uh, Father, thank you for giving us Jesus. We needed to know in person what you're, what you're like. We needed to hear from him how to talk to you. Lord, may we grow in our trust. May we grow in our hope. May we grow in our love. And may this daily conversation that we get to have with you, may it be a cornerstone of our life. May it be the way that we get to know you better and live in a way that honors you and changes us. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to have a song and then we'll be back for a benediction.